A deep teal presentation slide appears on the screen. White text reads, TI-24009 Tribal Opioid Response Pre-Application Webinar. The Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy. OTAP. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. OTAP at samhsa.hhs.governor May 16, 2024. The screen remains on this slide for a period of time. A cursor moves on the screen. Um, I know, that's what I just said. <laughs> a speaker box appears in the top right of the screen with a woman's face. The image disappears. The presentation slide remains on the screen. Then, a different speaker named William Longinetti appears in the top right corner. Okay. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the SAMHSA Tribal Opioid Response Grant or TOR pre-application webinar. My name is William Longinetti and I am a public health advisor with SAMHSA. That's all I William's video disappears. Then another speaker appears and William reappears. You know, we have Uh, next slide, please. A new slide titled, Housekeeping Announcements. An image of a cell phone on an open notebook. So just some housekeeping announcements before we begin. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, and we will make the recording available to everyone who attended. We'll also post it on the SAMHSA YouTube channel. Um, please remain on mute. And if you have questions, you can type them in the chat as we go through the slides. There will be an opportunity after we go through the slides to raise your hand and unmute and ask questions. Um, in addition to recording the webinar today, we will be compiling the questions for an FAQs document that we will make available on the SAMHSA webpage. Next slide, please. A new slide titled the support for tribes. Text on screen. SPSA is committed to supporting the delivery of services and resources to maintain and improve the behavioral health of American Indians and Alaska Natives A.S.A. Nicholas The SPSA Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy is the primary point of contact for tribes, tribal organizations, urban Indian programs and other stakeholders on tribal behavioral health. The office leads and supports the wide actions to improve behavioral health of tribal communities, and it also leads to tribal consultation, outreach, education, engagement efforts, and TAC. An image of a circle of multicolored figures holding hands. AMSA is committed to supporting the delivery of services and resources to maintain and improve the behavioral health of American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, we work in the SAMHSA Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy, and we are the primary point of contact for tribes, tribal organizations, urban Indian programs, and other stakeholders on tribal behavioral health. And we lead and support SAMHSA-wide actions to improve behavioral health of tribal communities. A new slide titled Speakers. The speaker reads out the text on screen. Next slide, please. I am joined today by my colleagues, Michelle Carnes, public health advisor on the tour team, uh, Irene Darko, public health analyst on the tour team, and also Olivia Klein-Thomas, who is a grants management specialist on the tour grant, who works in our division of grants management. Next slide. 
a new slide titled Topics to be Covered. Text on screen. 1. The TO or Notice of Funding Opportunity. 2. Applying for a SA grant. 3. Completing the three registration processes. 4. Project narrative, responding to the evaluation criteria. 5. Responding to the participant protection guidelines. 6. Submitting the application. 7. Technical assistance and resources. And do we have Irene on yet? Let's see. I know we were having technical difficulties with one of our staff, but um, we can go ahead. So these are the topics we will be covering today in our webinar. So the first thing we'll be doing is reviewing the TOR Notice of Funding Opportunity that was recently released. Then we'll be discussing how to apply for a SAMHSA grant. After that, we will go over how to complete the three registration processes. Um, then we will discuss the project narrative and responding to the evaluation criteria. Then we will uh, explain how to respond to the participant protection guidelines. After that, we will discuss um, submitting the application. And finally, we will review technical assistance and resources. Next slide, please. A new slide titled Tribal Opioid Response Grants TOR Overview. A table with information regarding the funding opportunity is displayed. The speaker reads out the text. So here's a snapshot of some of the high-level details of the grant. We are discussing funding opportunity TI24009. The due date for the grant application is July 1st, 2024. Um, we estimate having up to $63 million to award and to make up to 130 awards. For information about the amount you can apply for, please consult appendix, appendix, appendices A and B and the TOR NOFO. Um, they contain the information you'll need to determine your award amount. There is no cost sharing or match required for the TOR grant. We anticipate a start date of September 30th, 2024, and we anticipate making the grant awards by September 23rd, 2024. Um, we are happy to announce that the TOR grant is now a five-year grant, so you'll be um, submitting an application for a five-year grant project. And the eligibility for the grant has not changed. Uh, eligibility is limited to federally recognized tribes, uh, federally recognized American Indian or Alaskan Native tribes or tribal organizations. Tribes and tribal organizations may apply individually or as a consortium or in partnership with an urban Indian organization. Next slide, please. A new slide titled TOR Program Purpose. Text on screen. First bullet. Increase access to FDA-approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder MOUD and support the continuum of prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services for opioid use disorder OUD and co-occurring substance use disorders. Second bullet. TOR also similarly addresses stimulant misuse and use disorders, including for cocaine and methamphetamine. Third bullet. SCA requires that MOUD be made available to those diagnosed with OUD. MOUD includes methadone, buprenorphine products, including single-entity buprenorphine products, buprenorphine-slash-naloxone tablets, films, buckle preparations, long-acting injectable buprenorphine products, and injectable extended-release naltrexone. So the purpose of the TOR grant is to increase access to FDA-approved medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder and to support the continuum of prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services for OUD and other co-occurring substance use disorders. We also address and support um, treating stimulant misuse and use disorders, including for cocaine and methamphetamine. And we require that MOUD be made available to those diagnosed with opioid use disorders. 
MOUD can include methadone, buprenorphine products, or in, uh, injectable extended release naltrexone. And uh, to take us through the next couple slides, I want to hand it over to my colleague, Irene Darko. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I am going to continue as far as the, uh, the purpose of the TOR program is concerned. The TOR program also support the national tribal health agenda, cultural uh, the cultural wisdom declaration and inclusion of ancestral cultural knowledge, wisdom, ceremony, and practices of American Indian and Alaska Native tribes into the award application. Um, a new slide titled TOR Program Purpose Continued. Text on screen. In addition to treatment, TOR recipients may employ culturally appropriate effective treatment, prevention, harm reduction, and recovery support services to ensure that individuals are receiving a comprehensive array of services across the spectrum of prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and recovery. Tribal entities are also encouraged to incorporate National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda TBH of foundational elements, priorities, and strategies as appropriate. I am joining in late. I apologize for my tardiness. I was having technical difficulties. Uh, thank you well for starting off for me. Uh, I am going to hand it over to Michelle to go over the act as far as activities of the grant is concerned, and then I'll pick up after Michelle. Uh, goes, goes through the activities. Thanks, Irene. Um, hi, welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Uh, next slide, please. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities. The text on screen summarizes what the speaker is saying. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in TOR, but every grant must select some area of prevention, treatment, harm reduction, or recovery. You can focus on one area. You can propose a combination. You propose the TOR program that's based on the needs of your community. After four months, we do expect there to be, at a minimum, a project director in place who is beginning the work of the grant. And your application must include estimates of how many unduplicated people you will serve with your grant, which will become your numeric goals if you are funded. Next slide, please. A new slide titled Example of Project Timeline, a table outlining a list of project activities and the time range of their implementation. Three activities are highlighted in the fourth month. So this is an example of a work plan, and you can see that by the fourth month, they're conducting community outreach, they're screening referrals, and they're collecting data. Um, so think about what you need to have in place so that work can begin by the fourth month. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities Continued. Text on screen. Recipients are required to select one or more activities from the treatment, harm reduction, prevention, or recovery support services activities listed in the NOFO. Recipients are not required to choose an activity from each of the service areas but should choose the most appropriate set of services and activities to address OUD treatment and or recovery and or prevent overdoses in their community. So as I mentioned, the required activities are divided into treatment, harm reduction, prevention, and recovery support services categories. And so you, as an applicant, you select and you propose the combination or the focus of those elements to form your TOR program. And the way that it's written, it can make it seem like you have to choose something from every category because it does say required activities. But to be clear, what's required is that you choose from among those categories. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities. Treatment. Text on screen. Implement service delivery models that enable the full spectrum of treatment and recovery support services that facilitate positive treatment outcomes and long-term recovery from opioid and stimulant use disorders. Models for evidence-based treatment include, but are not limited to hub and spoke or center of excellence models, treatment in federally and state regulated opioid treatment programs, addiction specialty care programs, non-specialty settings, and residential programs. So let's talk about treatment first. Um, if you intend to focus on or include treatment services for TOR funds, here are some potential models that you may want to consider for your approach. 
um, hub and spoke, center of excellence, treatment in specialty care, non-specialty care settings, or residential programs. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities, Treatment Continued. Text on screen. First bullet. Primary care of other clinical practice settings where MOUD is provided and linkages to psychosocial services and recovery support services centered on patient needs related to the provision of comprehensive treatment of OUD. Second bullet. Programs that address the multifaceted and complex needs of individuals with stimulant use disorder, like polydrug use, psychosis, violence, co-occurring stimulant use and mental disorders, etc. Third bullet. Low-threshold MOUD treatment programs that offer services and make minimal requirements of patients, thus removing or reducing barriers to treatment and expanding access to care. Fourth bullet. Support innovative telehealth strategies in rural and underserved areas to increase the capacity of communities to support OUD or stimulant use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery. Next slide. You may also want to consider linking primary care and treatment, addressing stimulant use disorder if that's an issue in your community, making treatment low threshold to reduce barriers to treatment, or using telehealth to do prevention treatment and recovery. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities, Recovery. Text on screen. Recovery support includes a broad range of services to assist individuals and families to initiate, stabilize, and maintain long-term substance use disorder SUD recovery. Grant recipients may implement recovery support services, including First bullet. Train peer recovery specialists and or recovery coaches following the guidelines required in each state or jurisdiction. Hire or contract with peer recovery specialists and or recovery coaches, including those working towards certification, to provide services such as recovery coaching, telephone recovery checkups, warm lines, and other supports. Second bullet. Recovery housing. Recovery housing is one component of the SUD treatment and recovery continuum of care. While recovery residences vary widely in structure, all are centered on peer support and a connection to services that promote long-term recovery. So that was treatment, let's talk about recovery. And to be clear, these are all very much laid out in detail in the NOFO, so we want to cover these just so that if you have questions about any particular area, we can dive in. Um, so let's talk about recovery. Uh, recipients can use TOR funds to support recovery support services. And so if you intend to focus on or include recovery services, here are some potential activities you may want to consider for your approach. So first, there's the definition of recovery to keep in mind. It's very broad on purpose. You may want to, tre to train uh, peer recovery specialists or recovery coaches, or maybe you need TOR support to do recovery housing. And so these are safe, healthy family-like substance-free living environments that support individuals in recovery from addiction. And if you go this route, just keep in mind, you must describe how the, the recovery housing supported under the grant is an appropriate and legitimate facility. And that means state or other credentialing or certification or an established or recognized model. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities, Recovery Continued. Text on screen. First bullet. Promoting client job training and education. Grant recipients may pay for or provide logistical assistance to clients to access peer recovery training, provide assistance with soft skills development, and connect clients to job fairs and other events to network and find career opportunities. Second bullet. Creating recovery supportive communities, such as facilitating recovery events or by designating space to support recovery group meetings and social gatherings. Next slide, you may pay bed fees for program participants. You can support rehabilitation and improvements to housing facilities. However, just keep in mind, you can't use federal funds for new building construction. You can pay fees related to state certification and support technologies to assist with connecting residents to services. You can promote job training and education for people in recovery. You can create recovery communities through events and supporting space for meetings and social gatherings around recovery identities. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities, Prevention. Text on screen. Implement prevention and education services including. First bullet. 
develop culturally informed and responsive evidence-based community prevention efforts, such as strategic messaging on the consequences of opioid and stimulant misuse, implement school-based prevention programs, elder education, and outreach. Second bullet. Enhance community-wide policies and procedures to incorporate trauma-informed practices that acknowledge the impact of historical and generational trauma. Third bullet. Train tribal staff, like behavioral health providers, school staff, housing personnel, youth workers, etc., in adverse childhood experiences ACS and social determinants of health SDOH fourth bullet. Provide psychosocial educational activities that address behavioral health disparities and the social determinants of health. Fifth bullet. Provide support to individuals impacted by SUDs, including case management, referrals, and warm handoffs to resources and psychosocial interventions. Okay, covered treatment and recovery. Let's move on to your options for prevention. If you intend to focus on or include prevention services, here's some potential and broadly defined activities you may want to consider for your approach. Especially for this program, culturally informed, as well as evidence-based prevention, developing community-wide policies and procedures, training tribal staff to recognize someone at risk, providing psychosocial educational activities, and supporting people impacted by substance use disorders are all appropriate ways to spend your TOR funds. And so here are some examples of prevention from TOR recipients. Red Cliff Wellness School Curriculum, the PAX Good Behavior Game, Healthy Way of Living Model, Hidden in Plain Sight, The Gathering of Native Americans, or GONA, or the American Indian Life Skills Curriculum. Those are just some examples. And now I will pass it on to Irene to talk about harm reduction. So um, now that we have gone over treatment, prevention, uh, recovery activities, um, let's jump into some of the um, harm reduction activities that applicants can use TOR funds to support. A new slide titled TOR Required Activities, Harm Prevention Slash Reduction. Text on screen. Implement harm prevention and reduction services including. First bullet. Train peers, first responders, and other key tribal members on the recognition of opioid overdose and appropriate use of the overdose reversal medication naloxone. Second bullet. Purchase and distribute naloxone, Narcan. Third bullet. Provide harm reduction services on site, either singularly or in collaboration with a community-based harm reduction organization. Harm reduction services funded under this grant must adhere to federal, state and local laws, regulations, and other requirements related to such programs or services. Um, recipients may use toll funds to support harm reduction or harm prevention activities. Uh, this includes training of first responders, peers and other key tribal members on the recognition of opioid overdose and appropriate use of overdose reversal medication um, naloxone. You can also uh, purchase and distribute naloxone uh, products, provide harm reduction services on site, either on singular, singularly or collaboration with a community-based harm reduction organization, you can also uh, do harm reduction services funded under the grant, that, but it must adhere to the federal, state, and local laws, the jurisdictions, and also other requirements relating to such program or services. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Allowable Activities. Text on screen. Allowable activities are an allowable use of grant funds but are not required. Recipients may use grant funds to provide any allowable activity if it does not interfere or prevent the grant recipient from performing all required activities and serve the total number of unduplicated individuals each year of the grant. Allowable activities may include First bullet Complete a community readiness or needs assessment and a comprehensive strategic plan based on the most current epidemiological data for the tribe to address the gaps in prevention, treatment, and recovery support services identified by the tribe. Tribes may use existing plans if available. Second bullet. Implement workforce development activities to ensure that individuals working in tribal communities are well-versed in strategies to prevent and treat opioid misuse. Third bullet. Incorporate culturally appropriate and traditional practices into the program design and implementation. Fourth bullet. 
Develop and implement evidence-based contingency management programs to treat stimulant use disorder and concurrent substance misuse, and to also improve retention and care. Um, one other uh, activities, uh, allowable activities, uh, when we say allowable activities, what does it mean? Allowable means necessary and reasonable for award performance and allowable under the cost principle which is 45 CFR 75, applicants may propose to use funds for the following activities. And these are an examples that you can use. Uh, completing community readiness or needs assessments, um, and also a comprehensive strategic plan based on the most recent epidemiological data for the tribes to address the gaps in prevention treatment, recovery support services identified by the tribe. Tribes may use existing plans if available. Um, implement workforce development activities to ensure that individuals are working, working in the tribal community are well versed in the strategies to prevent and treat opiate misuse. Uh, you can also incorporate culturally appropriate and traditional practices into the program design and implementation. Um, you are also allowed to develop and implement evidence-based contingency management program to treat stimulant use disorder and also concurrent substance misuse and to also improve retention in care. Uh, please know allowable activities are allowable use of grant funds, but they are not required. A new slide titled TOR Allowable Activities continued. Text on screen. First bullet, provide assistance to patients with treatment costs and develop other strategies to eliminate or reduce treatment costs for under and uninsured patients. Grant recipients may provide cost assistance to clients for transportation, child care, and other supportive services. Second bullet, address barriers to receiving MOUD by reducing the cost of treatment, developing innovative systems of care to expand access to treatment, engage and retain patients in treatment, address discrimination associated with accessing treatment, including third bullet, provide treatment transition and coverage for patients re-entering communities from criminal justice settings or other rehabilitative settings. Fourth bullet, Purchase and or implement mobile and or non-mobile medication units that provide appropriate privacy and adequate space to administer and dispense medications for OUD treatment in accordance with federal regulations. Fifth bullet. Support education, screening, care coordination, risk reduction interventions, testing, and counseling for HIV AIDS, hepatitis, and other infectious diseases. Next slide, please. Um... You can also provide assistance to patients with treatment costs and develop other strategies to eliminate or reduce treatment costs for under and, under and uninsured patients. Grant recipients may provide cost assistance to clients for transportation, child care, and other supportive services. Uh, you are, all applicants can also address barriers to receiving M MOUD by reducing the cost of treatment developing innovative system of care to expand access to treatment, engage and retain patients in treatment, address discrimination associated with assessing treatment. Um, you can also provide treatment transition and coverage for patients at re-entering communities from criminal justice setting or other rehabilitation settings. Um, you are also allowed to purchase or implement mobile or non-mobile medication unit that provide appropriate privacy and adequate spaces to administer and dispense medication for OUD treatment in accordance with federal regulation. Um, you can also support education, screening, care coordination, risk re uh, reduction interventions, testing and counseling for HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, and other infectious diseases. If you plan to implement contingency management programs, you must certify that you will comply with the condition and training requirement, as well as provide a plan to ensure the sub awardees who receives appropriate education on contingency management prior to implementation. Also, oversight of sub awardee contingency management implementation and operation, as well as 
Appendix M of the No Fall. The statement of certification must be provided in attachment eight of, the, of your application. The plan must be submitted within 90 days of the grant award. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Allowable Activities, continued. Text on screen. Support innovative telehealth strategies to increase the capacity of tribal communities to support OUD and stimulant use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery. Strategies may include providing a subscription for mobile services for phones or devices, or cell phone plan, to allow clients to access telehealth. First bullet. Grant recipients may purchase a comprehensive plan that includes data, text, and minutes for a new phone or data and phone minutes that can be uploaded and used by clients with existing phones or mobile devices. Second bullet. Grant recipients that purchase mobile plans for clients must also provide direct client-level treatment and or recovery support services with their TOR grant funds and the recipients of the mobile plans must be actively participating in those services. Third bullet. Grant recipients must have a system for documenting that clients are not eligible for other resources for mobile phone plans, including the Federal Lifeline Assistance Program, and if a client is eligible for other resources. It is determined those resources are insufficient to meet an individual's care needs in terms of the quality of the services or technology, or there are competing household needs for that service. Um, you are also uh, allowed to support innovative telehealth strategies to increase the capacity of tribal communities to support OUD or stimulant use disorder prevention, treatment, and recovery. Strategies may include providing a subscription for mobile services of phone or devices um, to allow clients to access telehealth. Please note, Mobile phones or devices cannot be purchased with toll funds for clients through grant recipients or through grants recipients. Um, recipients are allowed to take advantage of the subscription plan that offers free devices with um, their services. The use of mobile services should be encouraged to enable, enable access to treatment recovery and other related services. Clients will not be allowed to accrue additional charges if toll funds for mobile applications and mobile and mobile other content that is not related to treatment and recovery services. Next slide. A new slide titled TOR Allowable Activities continued. Text on screen. First bullet. Develop and implement tobacco or nicotine product, like vaping, cessation programs, activities, and or strategies. Second bullet. Assess the impact of the grant. Consider working with tribal epidemiology centers or an evaluator to implement this activity. However, including an evaluator in the staffing components is not required. Third bullet. Provide cultural competency and implicit bias reduction training to service providers to increase awareness and acknowledgement of differences in language, age, culture, socioeconomic status, political and religious beliefs, sexual orientation and gender identity, and life experiences. Fourth bullet. Provide activities that addresses behavioral health disparities and the social determinants of health. So um, finally, you can use uh, you can also use funds to develop and implement tobacco or nicotine products, sensation uh, sensation programs, activities, and also strategies. You can assess the impact of the grant, provide culturally competent, and implement bias reduction training to service providers to increase awareness and acknowledgement of difference in language age, culture, socioeconomic status, political and religious beliefs, sexual orientation and gender identity and life experience. You can also provide activities that addresses behavior, health disparities and social determinants of health. TOR is flexible when it comes to addressing the needs, whether at the community or individual level. I will pass it on. I will now pass it on to Michelle to go over the capacity building of the novel. A new slide titled Capacity Building. Text on screen. First bullet. 
Capacity building involves strengthening the ability of an organization to meet identified goals so that it can sustain or improve the delivery of services. Second bullet. SPU recognizes that you may need to implement capacity building activities to provide or expand direct services or improve their effectiveness. If funds will be used for capacity building, applicants must describe the use of funds for capacity building in the project narrative. Examples of capacity building include developing partnerships with other providers for service delivery, training and workforce development, policy development to support needed service system improvements, implementing, acquiring or upgrading health information technology HIT, and providing cultural competency and implicit bias reduction training to service providers. Thank you, Irene. Um, let's talk about using TOR funds for capacity building. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with this grant, this was previously called infrastructure development, and it formally had a cap of 15%, but that is no longer a limit for the TOR program, starting with this NOFO. Capacity building activities can include, but are not limited to, training, education, technical assistance, expansion of partnerships, development of program materials. And so there are some examples there, developing partnerships, your training, policy development, implementing or upgrading health information technology, HIT, doing cultural competency and implicit bias reduction to training to service providers. So um, just as Irene was saying, these are things that are allowable. They are considered capacity building, formally a 15% cap on these activities. That's no longer the case. Okay, now I will pass it to Will to talk about evidence-based practices. A new slide titled Using Evidence-Based Practices. Text on screen. First bullet. SPSA services grants are intended to fund services or practices that have a demonstrated evidence base and that are appropriate for the population of focus. An evidence-based practice EBP refers to approaches to prevention, treatment, or recovery that are validated by some form of documented research evidence. Second bullet. If an EBP exists for the population of focus and types of problems or disorders being addressed, the expectation is that EBPs will be utilized. If one does not exist but there are evidence-informed and or culturally promising practices that are appropriate or can be adapted, these interventions may be implemented in the delivery of services. Third bullet. Applicants are encouraged to visit the SA Evidence-Based Practice Resource Center at www.samhsa.gov forward slash EBP dash resource dash center and SA's national network to eliminate disparities in behavioral health NNED at https colon forward slash forward slash nned.net to identify evidence-informed and culturally appropriate mental illness and substance use prevention and treatment practices that can be implemented in your project. Thank you, Michelle. And this is standard language across SAMHSA's grants, but um, it's important to note that SAMHSA's services grants are intended to fund services or practices that have a demonstrated evidence base and that are appropriate for the population of focus. Uh, if an evidence-based practice exists for the population of focus and types of problems or disorders being addressed, the expectation is that evidence-based practices will be used. If one does not exist, but there are evidence-informed and or culturally promising practices that are appropriate or can be adapted, these interventions may be implemented in the delivery of services. And that third bullet uh, has a couple resources that SAMHSA has developed um, with some evidence-based practices that um, you, know, you might take a look at. Next slide, please. A new slide titled Data Collection Forward Slash Performance Measurement. Text on screen. First bullet. You must collect and report data for SA to meet its obligations under the Government Performance and Results Modernization Act of 2010 GPRA. Second bullet. The two data collections tools used in the TOR program include 1. The GPR Client Outcome Measures for Discretionary Programs. This tool collects data on program participants and the services provided during the program. Data will be collected at three points, intake to SA-funded services, six months post-intake, and discharge from the SA-funded 15 services. 2. The SOR slash TOR program instrument. This tool collects data on program level outcomes and is submitted on a quarterly basis in SPARS. The SOR slash TOR program instrument will collect the following measures. 
naloxone and other opioid overdose reversal medications purchase and distribution, overdose reversals, drug checking supplies, education of school-aged children, first responders, and key community sectors on opioid and or stimulant misuse. Third bullet. Performance data will be reported to the public as part of SIS's Congressional Budget Justification. And these are just some details about the data collection that will be required on the grant. You must collect and report data for SAMHSA to meet its obligations under the Government Performance and Results Modernization Act, or GIPRA. And the two data collection tools that we use in the TOR program include uh, one, the GIPRA Client Outcome Measures Tool for Discretionary Programs. Um, this is what we usually refer to when we talk about the GIPRA. This tool collects data on program participants and the services provided during the program. Specifically, we're talking about um, clients who receive treatment services funded through the grant. And data is collected using this tool at three points at intake into the SAMHSA funded services six months post intake, and also at discharge. The second tool is the SOAR tour program instrument, which collects data on program level outcomes on a quarterly basis and includes uh, data on the following measures, naloxone and other opioid overdose reversal medications, opioid uh, overdose reversals, drug checking supplies, such as fentanyl testing strips, and education of school-aged children, first responders, and others in the community on opioid or stimulant misuse. And this data that you collect will be reported um, as part of uh, SAMHSA's congressional budget justification. And now I will pass it back to Michelle, who's going to discuss a few other TOR grant requirements. A new slide titled TOR requirements. Text on screen. First bullet. No cost sharing match requirements for TOR second bullet. Three requirements for experience and credentials. One, a provider organization for services appropriate to the award must be involved in the project. The provider may be the applicant or another organization committed to the project as demonstrated by a letter of commitment LOC more than one provider organization may be involved. Two, applicants must submit official documentation that all participants tribal mental health or substance abuse treatment provider organizations either comply with all applicable tribal requirements for licensing accreditation and certification or provide documentation from the tribe or other tribal governmental unit that licensing accreditation and certification requirements do not exist three Non-tribal mental health or substance use disorder treatment provider organizations must have at least two years of experience, as of the due date of the application, providing relevant services. Official documents must establish that the organization has provided relevant services for the last two years. Non-tribal mental health or substance use disorder treatment provider organizations must comply with all applicable local, city or county, and state licensing, accreditation, and certification requirements as of the due date of the application. All right, so first we'll talk about what's not required. Woohoo, no cost sharing match requirements. That's awesome. Uh, but there are three requirements for experience and credentials to all service provider organizations. And so for the first one, um, eligible tribes and tribal organization mental health or substance use disorder prevention, treatment, recovery support service providers must be in compliance with all applicable tribal licensing, accreditation, and certification requirements as of the due date of the application. And for the second one, you will see attachment one for more information on the attestation statement that either the organizations in your application meet these local requirements, or you will document that such official requirements do not exist. And then finally, uh, non-tribal organizations must show that they have two years of experience doing this work in order to be part of TOR, and that only applies to any non-tribal organizations you're partnering with. Next slide, please. A new slide titled Other Expectations. Text on screen. First bullet. SPA expects recipients to use grant funds to implement high-quality programs and policies that are recovery-oriented, trauma-informed, and equity-based as a means of improving behavioral health. Second bullet. Tribal applicants are encouraged to briefly cite the applicable foundational elements, priorities, and strategies from the National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda TBHA that are addressed by their grant application. 
The TBH can be accessed at samhs.gov forward slash tribal dash affairs. Third bullet. SSA strongly encourages all recipients to adopt a tobacco or nicotine inhalation or vaping product free facility or grounds policy and to promote abstinence from all tobacco products except in regard to accepted tribal traditions and practices. Fourth bullet. Recipients must utilize third party and other revenue realized from the provision of services to the extent possible. So whatever combination of prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction that you choose for your application, we expect a high quality program that serves your community's behavioral health. SAMHSA working with tribes, the Indian Health Service and National Indian Health Board uh, developed the first collaborative National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda, which we mentioned earlier, the TBHA. We do encourage you to check that out and cite the aspects that resonate with your application. We do encourage a tobacco-free facility policy, excluding traditional tribal practices, which may use that. And in addition, recipients are required to implement policies and procedures that ensure other sources of funding are utilized first when available to serve that individual. But if this person is best served by using TOR funds, then please do so. Next slide. A new slide titled Other Expectations Continued. Text on screen. First bullet. Recipients are also expected to facilitate the health insurance application and enrollment process for eligible uninsured clients. Second bullet. Recipients should also consider other systems from which a potential service recipient may be eligible for services, for example, the Veterans Health Administration or Senior Services. Third bullet. SPSA encourages all recipients to address the behavioral health needs of active duty military service members, returning veterans, and military families in designing and developing their programs and to consider prioritizing this population for services, where appropriate. Okay, again, in general, try a range of ways to get needs met, insurance, IHS, VA. If the grant is the way, after ex exhausting all of those other options, then use it. Speaking of VA, we encourage you to actively address the behavioral health needs of veterans in your communities, and I will pass it to Will to talk about expectations for numbers served by your poor dollars. A new slide titled Section B, Outcomes Table. A table with empty cells to indicate the number of unduplicated individuals to be served with award funds over the course of five years. Below. Note. Of those individuals receiving treatment and recovery support services, applicants must indicate the total number of individuals who will complete the CSAT Government Performance and Results Act Client Outcome Measures for Discretionary Programs tool for each award year. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, as part of Section B of your application, which is the Proposed Implementation Approach section, applicants will have to complete this table with their projected number of individuals who will receive each type of service each year of the TOR grant. So these are just projected numbers. Um, they don't have to be exact. However, um, you know, we're asking you to list the total number of individuals you expect to provide each of these types of services through through the grant uh, for each year of the of the grant project. And so that includes treatment, recovery support, prevention, and harm reduction, and then um, if you recall, we were just discussing the GIPRA discretionary uh, client level tool. When you take the number of individuals who will receive treatment services and any applicable recovery support services and add those two numbers together, that gives you your GIPRA target. And so that's what will go in that last row. Next slide, please. A new slide titled Appendix A, Base Award Allocation. A table outlining the IHS user population in relation to the base award per year allocation amounts. Populations of 1 to 10,000 can apply for a maximum of $250,000. Populations between 10,000 and 1 and 20,000, up to $425,000. Populations between 20,000 and 1 and 40,000, up to $750,000 and populations above 40,000 and 1, up to $1,750,000. The speaker reads text below the table. And we wanted to review this so that everyone is very clear about the award amount that you're eligible to apply for. So the grant awards for TOR will consist of base awards and also need-based supplement awards for eligible applicants. 
The funding for base awards will be distributed based on the fiscal year 2023 Indian Health Service user population estimate data and the values provided above. So we have used the IHS data, um, you know, since we started this grant and we're continuing to use that to determine the base awards. And this, if you've had tour grants in the past, then this table will look familiar. The first column represents uh, tribes IHS user population numbers. And then the second column shows you the maximum base award for which you can apply each year. And um, applicants may elect to apply for less than the amount shown but uh, you may not apply for more than the amount shown um, as your base award. And if a tribe elects to partner with another tribe to apply as a consortium, the base award amounts of each tribe may be summed for the total application budget. And um, if you are in need of the user population uh, estimate data, we will share that data with everyone who registered for the webinar. A new slide titled Appendix B, Need Based Supplement Eligibility. Text on screen and a table. The speaker reads out the text above the form and the text in the form. Next slide, please. And in addition to um, Appendix A, um, applicants, this is Appendix B, applicants should complete the table below. I'm sorry, let me go back. Applicants who plan to serve one or more of the counties listed in Appendix B, which will be uh, in the NOFO, will be eligible for additional need-based supplemental grant funds. So you'll, when you go to the NOFO in Appendix B, you'll see a list of counties. And so applicants should complete the table found in Appendix A and indicate which county or counties they plan to serve with the TOR grant. And the exact amount of supplemental funds available will be determined after application submission. So you will complete this table inserting the name of your tribe, your um, user population estimate, your service unit, and any counties you will serve from Appendix B, and submit this table in, in Attachment 9. And if your application includes multiple partnering tribes, you should complete a table for each tribe in the application. And I see a bunch of questions coming in and, and uh, we will be getting to your questions. We just wanna get through the slides first. Next slide, please. A new slide titled, What's New in TOR Text on Screen. First bullet, updated formula, which includes a need-based supplement. Second bullet, increased program length from three to five years. Third bullet, increased program food allowance for events, now $10 per person. Fourth bullet, increase support for capacity building, formerly infrastructure, as defined on PP 13 through 14. And this is just a summary of what is new this year in the TOR grant. As I just reviewed, we have an updated formula, which includes a need-based supplement and a base award. We have increased the program length from two to five years. Um, we increased the food allowance for events uh, up to now $10 per person per day. And we have increased our support for capacity building, which we formerly referred to as infrastructure. And I'm going to pass it back to Irene, who's gonna go over some additional resources. Thank you, Raul. A new slide titled to Applying for ASAM HS a grant. HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash tribal dash affairs forward slash funding dash opportunities. SAMHS a grant resources. PDF links are provided within the presentation slide titled Developing a Competitive SAMHS a Grant Application and FY 2024 Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Notice of Funding Opportunity Application Guide. Next slide. Um, so please visit the link on the website address that is showing samsa.gov slash tribal affairs slash funding opportunity. We have tons and tons of resources that will help you in completing your application. 
Um, we have the PDFs, um, we have Word Docs, um, other resources, um, information on how to do the application, uh, what not to do, what to do, all of that is on this website. Um, next slide, please. A new slide titled three, completing the three registration processes. So there is a three step process in registering before you can complete your application. You have uh, the system for award management. Uh, we have the SAMS on uh, the grants.gov website. And then also we have the ERA comments. Uh, for those um, applicants who have not applied to SAMHSA grant before or who may be applying for federal uh, grant for the first time, uh, SAMS is a government-wide registry for entities doing business with the federal government. Uh, to create a SAM user account, go to sams.gov. Follow the guidance on the, on the website to register and obtain unique entity identifier. For, um, you must register your organization with SAM to obtain the e, 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 U, UEI. You cannot apply for the award without EUI, I mean UEI, and grant at grant got that. Grant.gov will reject your submission from the application if uh, your registration expires. Um, also, it is important that you start the SAMS registration process at least six weeks before the no for application deadline. Uh, Grant.gov is also an online portal for submitting federal award application. It requires a one-time registration to submit your application. ERA Commons is an online data platform that allows applicants, award recipients, and federal staff to securely share, manage, and process award-related information. Your organization must have a valid UEI number to complete the ERA Commons registration. ERA Commons registration is separate from grant.gov registration, but they can be done at the same time. Next slide. A new slide titled, Four Project Narrative, Responding to the Evaluation Criteria. Text on screen. The TO or NOFO has a limit of 10 pages for the project narrative. Key points to consider. First bullet. Make sure you put letter and number before each response, for example, a.1, a.2, b.1, etc. Second bullet. Pay attention to the points and recommend page limit for each section, for example, section A open parenthesis 10 points dash approximately one page close parenthesis. Third bullet. Provide necessary detail and precise language in responses. Fourth bullet. Do not direct reviewer to information in another section or in an attachment. So um, when it comes to the project narrative, uh, the project na narrative cannot be longer than 10 pages. Uh, the project narrative uh, needs to describe your plan for implementing your project. It includes the evaluation criteria sections A through E. The application will be reviewed and scored according to your response to the evaluation criteria. Please make sure before you respond to each criterion, you must indicate the section letters and number that is A1, A2, etc. You do not need to type the full criterion in each section. You do not, do not combine two or more criteria or, or refer to another section of the project narrative in your response, such as indicating that the response for B2 is in C1. Reviewers will only consider information including included in the appropriate numbered sections. Um, your application will be scored based on how well you address the cr criteria in each section. Next slide. A new slide titled, Five, Responding to Participant Protection Guidelines. A picture of a folder marked, Privacy and Confidentiality. Text on screen. First bullet. If applicable, make sure you address all of the SA participant protection slash human subjects guidelines. Second bullet. It is recommended that you address all of the bullets under each element. 
If a bullet is not applicable, put NA there are no page limits for this section. Third bullet. Do not just insert your policy and procedure manual. Um, I will now pass it on to Michelle to go over uh, responding to the participant protection guidelines. Awesome. Thank you, Irene. So let's talk about participant protection. Um, this is a required attachment. It is in, re in response to Section C of your application guide. And keep in mind that reviewers will assess your response. So for all of our grants, it is important to have safeguards protecting individuals from risks associated with their participation in SAMHSA projects. So make sure that you review all of the headings and provide a response about how you will protect people's privacy and get their consent to participate, among other aspects. Next slide. A new slide titled, Six, Submitting the Application. Text on screen. Warning. Do not wait until close to the deadline to submit your application. Allow for extra time to address any submission errors. A picture of three buttons, Submit, Track, and View. When you submit your application, the system will do a review to ensure that it is complete. And if you have an error message, it won't let you submit until you address it. Do not wait until July 1st or even June 30th. I'll put it this way. It's a good prevention practice to submit your application early as possible. Next slide. A new slide titled, Common Application Submission Errors. A picture of a stop sign. Text on screen. Errors. First bullet. Stop application processing. Second bullet. Must be corrected before submission. A picture of a warning sign, a yellow upside-down triangle symbol with an exclamation point inside. Text on screen. First bullet. Do not stop application processing. Second bullet. Correct it at your discretion. So more encouragement to start that process early and ensure that you have sufficient time to resolve any errors or warnings. The stop sign means you can't submit until you fix that. The yellow triangle means you'd best check that out before it goes forward, but you can still submit. Next slide. A new slide titled, Seven, Technical Assistance and Resources. A picture of books with the label, links and resources. We have lots of great resources to share with you. We'll be sending out these slides to all of you registrants, so don't panic about writing them all down. You are getting a copy. A new slide titled, Online Resources. Text on screen. First bullet. Published in 2016, the National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda was a monumental collaborative effort between many tribes, leaders, organizations, and federal agencies. In 2022, SVA began the process of convening the tribal leaders and federal agencies to discuss the next steps for the TBHA during these discussions. Tribal leaders emphasized the need for increased awareness and application of the TBHA. A picture of a book titled The National Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda, December 2016. Second bullet. TIP-61. Behavioral Health Services for American Indians and Alaska Natives. Third bullet. Describes the effects of substance use and mental illness among AI-ANs and discusses the importance of delivering culturally responsive, evidence-based services to address these behavioral health challenges. Next slide. All right, so these are two very important documents that you will want to check out. They are available on our website. Uh, this is published in 2016. We mentioned it, the Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda. Um, this is a wonderful document available on the OTAP website. Also, the TIP 61, which is Behavioral Health Services for American Indians and Alaska Natives, also available in the SAMHSA store. Very useful and very much recommended to help you apply for your grant. A new slide titled, Technical Assistance and Resources. Text on screen. First bullet. Opioid Resource Network at https colon forward slash forward slash opioidresponsenetwork.org forward slash. Second bullet. SPA Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Center at https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash tribal dash TTSC. Third bullet. The Addiction Technology Transfer Center ATTC Network at https colon forward slash forward slash attcnetwork.org forward slash. 
Tour templates and examples at https colon forward slash forward slash attcnetwork.org forward slash tor slash resource slash page forward slash. Next slide. All right, here are some more uh, TA resources with websites associated with them. The Opioid Response Network has an archive of TOR webinars on a wide variety of topics. They are our current TA provider. There's also SAMHSA's Tribal, Techni Tribal Training and Technical Assistance Center, um, which has a lot of good um, resources there as well around general uh, Native behavioral health. And then the Addiction Technology Transfer Center, ATTC Network, um, which also has an amazing website. Um, definitely take note of the tour templates and examples. Um, this has a lot of great uh, stuff around um, uh, if you're new to tour and you just want to get a feel for how it works uh, once awarded. This has things like sample position descriptions, tour work activities templates, examples of indigenous and strength-based approaches to address opioid misuse. So highly recommended, especially if you are a new applicant. Next slide. A new slide titled, Technical Assistance and Resources, Continued. Text on screen. First bullet. System for Award Management SAM at https colon forward slash forward slash www.sam.gov. Second bullet. Grants.gov at https colon forward slash forward slash www.grants.gov. Third bullet. ERA Commons at https colon forward slash forward slash public dot era dot nih dot gov forward slash commons forward slash public forward slash registration forward slash registration instructions dot jsp. Fourth bullet. Developing a competitive SA grant application at https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash grants forward slash applying forward slash forms dash resources. Fifth bullet. Evidence-based practices resource center at https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash ebp dash resource dash center. Six bullet. SA data at https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash data. All right. These are websites you will become very familiar with during your application process. We've mentioned many of them already. So get familiar with them now. We will pause for some questions. No, we will not. And then I will pass it on to Olivia from Grants Management. Thank you. Take it away, Olivia. A new slide with the title, Grants Management Overview. Tribal Opioid Response TOR Program. Text reads, Olivia Klein Thomas. Grants Management Specialist. Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Olivia.KleinThomas at samhsa.hhs.gov. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks once again for participating in today's pre-applicant work webinar. My name is Olivia Klein-Thomas, and I'm a Grants Management Specialist here at SAMHSA. Today, I will be providing just a brief Grants Management overview to give guidance and resources that will be helpful as you navigate through the application submission process. Next slide. A new slide with numbered objectives. So in this segment of today's webinar, we'll be briefly covering the objectives displayed on the slide. They include applying for a grant, applicable policies and regulations, factors affecting allowability of costs, budget narrative and justification, sample budget template, the SF-424 budget information form, key personnel, indirect cost rate agreement, funding limitations and restrictions, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Next slide. A new slide titled, Applying for a Grant. Available resources. A picture of a book titled, Developing a Competitive SA Grant Application. February 2018. Text on screen. First bullet. A manual is available for applicants. Linked text, Developing a Competitive SA Grant Application, PDF, 1 megabyte. Second bullet. 
This manual will provide applicants with valuable information about how to prepare a strong grant application. Third bullet. Additional information can be found at on https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash grants forward slash grants slash training slash materials. On this slide, we'll, we've included a PDF link to the manual for um, developing a competitive SAMHSA grant application. This manual will provide applicants with valuable information about how to prepare a strong grant application. We also have a link to our website. You'll see that a lot in this slide deck, which includes a host of valuable training materials for you to use while you're preparing your application for submission. Next slide. A new slide titled, Applying for a New SAMHS -A Grant. Available resources continued. A picture shows five help topics, all linked, related to the Introduction to Grants.Governor video series. Text on screen. First bullet. Learn more about registering, searching, and applying for federal grant opportunities. Second bullet. Linked text, recording of the SA applicant webinar, 39 minutes. Third bullet. Linked text, NOFO applicant webinar presentation PDF, 7 megabytes. Fourth bullet. Linked text, grants.governor video series. Fifth bullet. For more information, refer to https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhsa.gov forward slash grants forward slash applying. Sixth bullet. Note. Effective April 4, 2022, the Data Universal Numbering System DUNS number has been replaced by a unique entity identifier UEI assigned by the System for Award Management, SAM.gov. For more information, please refer to https colon forward slash forward slash sam.gov forward slash content forward slash DUNS dash UEI. So just a continuation of the various um, resources that can be found on the website. We have um, different recordings, one of which is another SAMHSA applicant webinar. Um, we have the NOFO webinar presentation and the grants.gov video series you see on your left side. And again, the link to our website. Um, just one quick note. Um, effective April 4, 2022, the DUNS number has been replaced with the unique entity identifier, UEI, that um, Irene mentioned earlier, uh, and that is assigned by the System for Award Management. So please, again, make sure that your organization has an active UEI prior to submission of your application. And um, as Michelle mentioned, it's strongly recommended that you start that registration process at least six weeks um, to make time for processing. Um, for more information, please refer to the link provided here. Next slide. A new slide titled, Applicable Policies and Regulations. Text on screen. First bullet. 45 CFR Part 75 Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards at https colon forward slash forward slash www.ecfr.gov forward slash current forward slash title dash 45 forward slash subtitle dash a forward slash subchapter dash a forward slash part dash 75. Second bullet. HHS Grants Policy Statement. The HHS Grant Policy Statement document contains important information on the general terms and conditions for discretionary grants and cooperative agreement awards at https colon forward slash forward slash www.hhs.gov forward slash sites forward slash default forward slash files forward slash grants forward slash grants forward slash policies dash regulations forward slash hhs gps 107.pdf Third bullet, the Notice of Funding Opportunity NOFO. Please reference the following application policies and regulations as you prepare your grant application for submission. This includes the 45 CFR Part 75 Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for Federal Awards. This is also known as the Uniform Guidance. 
This is the codified version of 45 CFR specifically for HHS. Um, we also have the HHS grants policy statement, which is a good resource. And finally, um, please ensure that um, you read your NOFO thoroughly for specific um, requirements of the TOR program. A new slide titled, Applicable Policies and Regulations Continued. Text on screen. 45 CFR Part 75. Uniform Administrative Requirements, Cost Principles, and Audit Requirements for HHS Awards. A table with information regarding the recipient types, uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and audit requirements is displayed. Next. Um, this table just gives an at-a-glance overview of 45 CFR Part 75. As you can see on the left, you have your various recipient types. Then the table display is further broken out by the uniform administrative requirements. Um, we have the cost principles column and then finally the audit requirements. So you just simply need to locate your recipient type that is applicable to your organization and apply the corresponding regulations when putting together your submission. Next slide. A new slide is titled, Factors Affecting Allowability of Costs. Text on screen. Proposed budgets must contain allowable, reasonable, and allocable costs, as defined under 45 CFR 75.403, 75.404, and 75.405. First bullet. Allowable costs, unless otherwise authorized by program statute are necessary and reasonable for award performance and allowable under the cost principles. Second bullet. Reasonable costs are not in excess of what would normally be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the decision was made, given market rates, effort, and the organization's documented policies. Third bullet. Allocable costs can be charged to a federal award if the goods or services are chargeable in accordance with relative benefits received. Your proposed budget must contain only allowable reasonable and allocable costs as defined under 45 CFR 75, 403, 404, and 405. This is the criteria that we use when we measure each proposed line item in your budget. Allowable costs, unless otherwise authorized by the program statute, are necessary and reasonable for award performance and allowable under the cost principles. Reasonable costs are not in excess of what would normally be incurred by a prudent person under the circumstances prevailing at the time the decision was made, given market rates, effort, and the organization's documented policies. Allocable costs can be charged to a federal award if the goods and services are chargeable in accordance with relative benefits received. Next slide. A new slide titled, Sample Budget Template. Text on screen. To reduce errors and expedite the review of your budget, it is highly recommended you use the SBUDGET budget template to complete the detailed budget and narrative justification required for submission with your application. First bullet. Over the years, numerous recipients requested a template to present budget information. We heard you. Second bullet. The budget template was created with expensive recipient consultation and input and designed to avoid all the common budget preparation pitfalls. Third bullet. The SU budget template includes a wealth of helpful tooltips and resources to assist and guide you with preparation of your budget. Fourth bullet. The budget template is available at https colon forward slash forward slash www.samhs.gov forward slash grants forward slash applying forward slash forms dash resources. Note, for SU to view all your budget data, you must flatten or convert the PDF to a non-editable format by printing to PDF before submission. The following resources provide guidance on use of the budget template. First bullet. Linked text, key features of the budget template. Second bullet. Linked text, budget template user's guide. Third bullet. Linked text, budget review checklist, for review of your detailed budget before submission. 
Okay, over the years, numerous recipients have requested a template to present their budget information. So in response, SAMHSA has created its own fillable PDF. Some of you may be familiar with it. Um, we highly recommend that you use um, this template to reduce errors and to help expedite the review of your budget. Um, I have provided a link of the template, which can be found on our website. Also, just a quick note for us to view all your budget data as the template was designed, you must flatten or convert the PDF to a non-editable format by printing to PDF before submission. I know that was a lot, but you could find all that information, details such as that in the following links. Next slide. A new slide is titled, Budget Narrative and Justification. Text on screen. First bullet. All applications must include a detailed budget and narrative justification that explains the federal and the non-federal expenditures. Second bullet. The detailed budget and narrative justification must be consistent with and support the project narrative. Third bullet. The budget narrative and justification must be concrete and specific. It must provide a justification for the basis of each proposed cost in the budget and how that cost was calculated. Continuing on the topic of budget narrative, all applications must include a detailed budget and narrative justification that explains the federal and the non-federal expenditures. The detailed budget and narrative justification must also be consistent with the support of the project narrative. The budget narrative and justification must be concrete and specific. It must provide a justification for the basis of each proposed cost in the budget and how that cost was calculated. Next slide. A new slide titled, Budget Narrative and Justification Continued. Text on screen. First bullet. Detailed breakdowns must be provided of the materials, quantities, number of persons, cost per unit or hour, number of hours or levels of effort, or other relevant basis to show how costs will be utilized towards achieving the grant's goals and objectives. This is to facilitate the determination of whether the proposed costs are allowable, reasonable, and allocable. Second bullet. The total for each budget category in your detailed budget with narrative justification must match the corresponding total of each object class category on your SF-424A in Section B budget categories. Third bullet. Your detailed budget with narrative justification should reflect the project costs for the first year only. In your budget summary table, you will show the amounts requested for future years and justify or explain any change in amounts requested for future years from what was requested in year one. Fourth bullet. An illustration of a budget and narrative justification is included in section K of the application guide. Um, just to give you a little more detail about the type of breakouts that we would like to see in your budgets, um, your breakouts must provide information like materials, quantities, um, number of people traveling, cost per unit, level of effort. Um, those are the type of um, calculations and breakouts that we want to see so we can determine whether the costs are allowable, reasonable, and allocable. And I won't read all of this for brevity. We can go to the next slide. A new slide is titled, Recipient Meetings. Okay, we stuck this in at the last minute. I wanted to go over recipient meetings. Um, SAMHSA will hold an in-person meeting in years one, three, and five of the project. You must include this travel in your submitted budget narrative, and we will be looking for this um, specific item. Um, if we don't find it, then we'll return it and ask for you to put it in your budget. You may um, budget for up to two people included in the include. That should, excuse me, include the project director. Um, these meetings are usually held in Washington, D.C. for two days, and I'm glad um, we're back to doing that. Um, if SAMHSA elects to switch to virtual meeting, your budgets may, um, we may allow you to revise your budget so you can rebudget those funds. Next slide. 
A new slide is titled, Budget Information for Non-Construction Programs SF424 A text on screen. The total of your detailed budget must match the totals in Section A of the SF-424A and budget category totals must match each of object class cost categories in Section B of the SF-424A ensure the following. A. In Section A Budget Summary, use Line 1 to enter the total federal request in the new or revised budget federally column. B. In Section A Budget Summary, use Line 2 to enter the total non-federal request in the new or revised budget non-federal F column. If there are multiple sources of non-federal funds you may also use Lines 3 and 4. C. In Section B Budget Categories, use the Grant Program, Function or Activity Column 1 to enter the total federal request for each object class category. D. Use Section B Budget Categories, use the Grant Program, Function or Activity Column 2 to enter the total non-federal matching contribution for each object class category. If there are multiple sources of non-federal funds you may also use Columns 3 and 4. Detailed instructions for completing the SF-424 can be found at, linked text, SF424-V1.0 instructions. Okay, moving on to the SF424A budget information form. Um, on the next two slides, we have an example of a completed form. Please refer to these slides if you need um, any help ensuring that your SF424A is accurate. I've listed some instructions on the slide that will assist you with accurately completing sections A and B here. Um, complete detailed instructions for completing the entire form can be found at the link provided. Okay, next slide. A new slide titled, Sample SF424A, Match Not Required. A table with budget summaries and budget categories filled out. Again, this is a visual reference of sections A and B of the slide. Um, I won't go through each item, but um, this will be a very helpful resource when completing your um, SF4248 to make sure you have all the numbers and figures and um, stuff like the CFDA number where it's supposed to be. Next slide. A new slide with another table of non-federal resources, forecasted cash needs, budget estimates of federal funds needed for balance of the project and other budget information filled out. And here we have a visual aid to help you complete section C through F. And again, there are instructions um, that are on the website that will walk you through um, the budget information form process. Next slide. A new slide titled, Avoiding Common Issues with the SF 424A Text Reads, Section D Forecasted Cash Needs Column. Total for First Year Line 15 Total. Must equal Section A Budget Summary Subsection New or Revised Budget Column, Total G Line. Five Totals Amount. Section B Budget Categories Column, Total Five Line. K Totals Must equal Section A Budget Summary. Subsection New or Revised Budget Column. Total G line. Five totals amount. The number of years indicated in Section E budget estimates of federal funds, subsection future funding periods years, must correlate with the number of years based on the start date and end date in Section 17 proposed project on the SF 424. Enter data for the first budget period in Section D and enter future budget periods in Section E. Please refer to the Notice of Funding Opportunity NOFO for additional guidance. Um, this slide highlights some examples of some common issues that you may run into um, when you're trying to complete the SF424A form. If you do run into any hiccups, just refer back to this guidance for assistance. It's kind of like a cheat sheet that uh, will help you correct those errors. A new slide titled, Key Personnel. Text on screen. One. The key personnel are the Project Director PD, with at least a 25% level of effort LOE. A list the position in your detailed budget, even if funded in kind or with matching contributions. B provide the PD resume and job or position description. 2. 
list the project director PD to be designated as contact in Section 8F and reflect their Commons ID in Field No. 4 of the SF-424. To obtain a Commons ID, the PD must be registered in ERA-3. If the PD position is being filled by a contractor or consultant, you must provide a copy of the formal written agreement that specifies the official relationship and addresses performance of all the required duties and responsibilities. Next. Okay, moving on to key personnel. The key personnel for this program is the project director with a minimum of 25% level of effort. Key personnel must be listed in your detailed budget even if there are no federal funds being requested for that position. So let's say, for example, you're charging um, this position as in-kind. We still need to see the position. Um, if you have the person's name, if you don't have the name, you can put to be determined and the level of effort that will be applied to the grant. Next, the project director should be designated as contact in Section 8A. I'm sorry, 8F is in Frank, and reflect their comments ID in field number four of the SF-424. Um, the PD must be registered in ERA to obtain a commons ID. You could find instructions on how to obtain this in the NOFO application guide. Next. A new slide titled, Indirect Cost Rate Agreement or Cost Allocation Plan. Text on screen. First bullet. Ensure that you submit your organization's current negotiated indirect cost IDC rate agreement or cost allocation plan with HHS or any other federal agency which required to support the charge of indirect costs. Second bullet. If your organization is opting to use 10% of modified total direct costs MTDC, then a clear statement must be made in your IDC narrative as follows. XYZ organization elects to use the de minimis rate of 10% of modified total direct costs MTDC third bullet. Ensure that you actually calculate the MTDC base to which your IDC rate is applicable. Fourth bullet. Include calculations to show how you arrived at your IDC base and IDC total. If you're charging indirect costs to the grant, please ensure that you include your organization's current negotiated indirect cost rate agreement or cost allocation plan in your application packet. If your organization is opting to use a de minimis rate, then a clear statement must be made to that effect in your indirect cost rate narrative. A new slide titled, Funding Limitations and Restrictions. Text on screen. Refer to the TOR funding restrictions and limitations in Section 4 of the NOFO and the standard funding restrictions in Section H of the NOFO Application Guide, as well as 45 CFR Part 75, for applicable administrative requirements and cost principles. First bullet. Food can be included as a necessary expense for individuals receiving the funded mental and or substance use disorder prevention, harm reduction, treatment, and recovery support services, not to exceed $10 per person per day. Second bullet. Only medications approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration FDA for treatment of opioid use disorder and or opioid overdose can be purchased with TOR funds. Third bullet. Recovery housing is an allowable cost. Funds may not be used to pay for non-recovery housing, housing application feeds, or housing security deposits. Fourth bullet. Funds may not be used to make direct payments to individuals to enter treatment or continue to participate in prevention or treatment services. C42 USC Section 1320-7B. Note. Recipients should maintain adequate documentation of which expenses correspond to the funding limitations or restrictions and the percent of the total grant award that will be used in each area where there is a limitation. Next. These are just a few of the funding restrictions or limitations for the program that I've copied directly from the NOFO for your reference. A full exhaustive list of restrictions can be found in section 4-3 of your NOFO. Your proposed budget must adhere to the funding limitations and restrictions. And I think that was my last slide. Next, yes. A new slide titled, Got Questions? Text on screen. Program or eligibility questions? William Longinetti. 
Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy, SA. 2402761190. Email william.longinettia.samhsa.hhs.gov. Fiscal or budget related questions? Office of Financial Resources, Division of Grants Management, SA. 2402761400. Email foacsat at samhsa.hhs.gov. Review process or application status questions? Sarah Fleming. Office of Financial Resources, Division of Grant Review, SA. 2402761693. Email sar.fleming at samhsa.hhs.gov. Problems submitting your application on grants.gov? Contact the grants.gov help desk. Email suppport at grants.gov. Phone 1-800-518-4726 or 1-800-518-GRANTS. ER a Commons Technical Questions? Contact the ER Service Desk. Web Support. Submit a web ticket open brace preferred method of contact close brace. Toll free 1-866-504-9552. Phone 3014027469, press 4 for SA grantees. Hours Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, closed on federal holidays. So if you have any additional fiscal or budget-related questions, feel free to reach out via the resource mailbox that we have listed. That's foacsat at samsa.hhs.gov. If you have any technical issues with your submission, you may contact ERA Help Desk or Grant.gov Help Desk. Next. A new slide reads, thank you. SAMHSA's mission is to lead public health and service delivery efforts that promote mental health, prevent substance misuse, and provide treatments and supports to foster recovery while ensuring equitable access and better outcomes. www.samhsa.gov 1877-SAMHSA7 1877-726-4727 1-800-487-4899-td-olivia.klein-thomas at samhsa.hhs.gov. 2402761413. Tawanda.jones at samhsa.hhs.gov. 2402472210. Okay, and that will do it for me. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Will. Thank you so much, Olivia. Um, and you can go to the next slide, which I think just says questions. The participants stop sharing screens. Throughout the Q&A, different webcams and names appear on screen as the participants take turns talking. Thank you. So um, I know we've been getting plenty of questions in the chat and the Q&A, but um, then you can continue to post your questions there. You may also... Uh, at this point, raise your hand using the raise hand button, and we can um, ask you to come off mute if you'd like to ask your question that way. But, um, and yeah, okay, so Joanna Madden has a question. Hi, thank you so much. Um, we are working with a, a tribe that um, will be providing prevention. Um, activities um, and in the attachment one letters of commitment uh, requirement, um, they are not um, including any other service providers. They are the, the service provider. They'll be um, mainly doing like education prevention activities in a school district. So in the requirement, are in the attachment one requirement for letters of commitment, are they the direct service provider or is the is the district needing to be somehow involved in um, in providing a, an agreement of some sort or a letter of commitment? Um, and there's a second part of my question, but I'll, I'll let you answer the first part. <laughs> um, or I can put the next part of the question is, 
they have already have a memorandum of understanding with the school district to be able to go into the schools for related activities. Um, and is that sufficient for this grant if the if the school district is a required party within a letter of commitment? Okay, thank you for your question. So if you're, um, yeah, we understand the TOR grant is broad. You may do treatment, prevention, recovery, or harm reduction, and uh, other types of services as well. So um, attachment one on page 24 of the NOFO, um, we ask you for a list of all the direct service provider organizations that will partner in the project, including the applicant agency, if it is a service provider organization. So if you're partnering with a prevention organization or an organization, another organization that will be providing the prevention services, um, are you asking if you would list them uh, in, in attachment one? Well, I, I think the applicant is the only one providing prevention services. So are is the requirement just that they provide a letter of commitment themselves? Um, so yeah, the, the tribe, you know, the eligibility is limited to tribes and tribal organizations. So, you know, your, your primary applicant is either going to be a tribe or a tribal organization. They don't have to provide any kind of letter of commitment, um, to, in order to apply. Like the primary applicant does not need to provide any letter of commitment to apply. So to meet the, the grants requirement, uh, would you just uh, submit an attachment that states um, that the the tribe is the direct service provider, and that's the list. Um, yes. Okay. That would that would that would make sense for that first attachment. Okay, so that would meet attachment one's requirement. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I don't. Did I answer your second question? Um, I guess you negated the need for the second question. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. And Cindy has a question. I always have questions. Thank you. Um, so I work with the Kiowa and Arco, and I think I've actually reached out to you, Mr. Longanetti. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I think my concern is <clears throat> we have a lot of housing. So we have to really search for that. And we talked about recovery houses. So uh, if we um, do not find those types of housings, the modification Cindy, I'm, of the budget. I'm afraid I'm only getting some of what you're asking, your audio is cutting in and out. Sure. Um, is that better? I heard I heard that. Cutting that way. Is that is that better? It seems like it still might be um cutting in and out. Okay, what I'll do is I'll put the question in the chat. Okay. Sorry okay. about that. And Jamie has her hand up. Hi, Will. Hi, Olivia. Hi, team. I am asking, could you go over the part about providing direct services or what the type of services that are allowable in the judicial setting or like some people who are incarcerated, just to make sure I get that clear? Is it just like care coordination and no treatment services while they are incarcerated or is it until they are actually transitioning out? Just for clarification. Thanks, Will. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I don't think we have like a exhaustive list of the types of services that you can provide in a um, in a jail or uh, justice setting. But I think um, you know because a lot of that might depend on. Um, you know, some of the rules that those entities have, but 
I believe SAMHSA, you know, this grant would allow you to um, to provide treatment pre-release as well. So it wouldn't necessarily be just limited to uh, care coordination, but you could provide, for example, you know, uh, medication inductions pre-release and connect people post-release. If um, if you have more specific questions, you can always email them to us as well. I know I've seen a couple questions that, um, you know, are, are pretty specific maybe to what you're trying to do in your program. So if your question, um, you know, doesn't get satisfactorily answered today, you can send them uh, via email. Okay. And hey, let's thank see. you, Will. Oh, thank you. And unfortunately, I don't see who... Um, Raise their hand first, but let's go with Margot. So, somewhere in the wonderful presentation, I heard the word attestation. And um, I'm looking in the FOA, I'm looking in the application guide, and of course, my trick is to use Control F to search for that word, and I'm not seeing it. But you guys are going to be sending out these um that webinar slides to us but i i just i don't see it anywhere for attestation unless it's in a different thing i looked um where i had mentioned so is it in somewhere else so i just want to make sure where um i i follow the correct instructions okay thank you um Trying to see offhand out of our team. Um, if I anybody... remember Michelle. Okay. Mentioned it. Michelle, do you recall the attestation that we mentioned? Yeah, I'm looking through my notes here just to come back to that. I could be wrong. <laughs> no, no, I don't think you are. I'm going to keep looking and I'll put it in the chat when I find it. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, I know we have a take um, Joanna's question and then we'll go to the chat. Uh, the indirect uh, cost rate agreement uh, where should that be attached? We talked about that in the budget section, the budget overview, um, but I'm not certain where, it doesn't state in the NOFA where to attach the agreement. All right. Um, it's not a part of the budget. It's separate. So when you complete your application, there should be a place where you should upload it. In In the other attachments section or... Um, it's part of your budget. As part of the okay, so in the budget section of in grants.gov, um, as an additional attachment, you would add it there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then we have we have some questions in uh in the Q and A section. Um, and so, Olivia, I might direct this one to you. Can we use funds for program rent and utilities? Um, yes, rent is a, an allowable cost in the program. Um, there are some rent questions that we do have that we usually um, want to know um, who is the owner. We might ask for information such as the lease, the square footage, but yes, it is allowable. Okay, thank you. And then um, we have a question about harm reduction um, from Annette. Can we utilize TOR funds to purchase nutritional supplements related to opiate stimulant detox? Um, and so Annette, I think I would need a little more information from you on that, but I know, um, so you, you know, you can reach out to us via email if you have not right done here. so already. Hello. So it's things like high dose vitamin C, GABA, 
uh, vitamin D, things like that. Um, we we typically will send people out the door with things like famotidine or on Dancitron and things like that. But we're also looking at some like vitamins and supplements. So we just right. are kind of wanting to know as well as there's some data and studies out about for stimulant use, uh, things like pre-workout. <laughs> and so we don't necessarily want to give them kind of a grocery list and say, go to the store. It's just kind of the same as sending them home with a naloxone prescription. They don't typically pick that up at the pharmacy. So we really kind of want to make these little bags, these little bags that they go home with that are prepackaged. And so wanting to know if those are some things that we can utilize our funds for. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I think, um, you know, in terms of what's allowable under this grant, um, you know, when it comes to any kind of medication or supplement, we're kind of limited to the language that you see in the NOFO about um, just you know, following FDA approved uses of medications and really, you know, um, we're kind of limited to the medications for the treatment of opioid use disorder. But, um, you know, I understand, um, you know, a lot of people have really great ideas for uh, new interventions for harm reduction, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. We, we'd have to hear a little more, but um, so if you haven't done so already, you can reach out via email, and I apologize if that doesn't answer your no question. Worries. I think some questions, you know, are, are um, we, we need to hear a little more from you because they're more unique to your application. But thank you um, for that. And then, so I know um, we had a question come in about, and I think Michelle had covered this section, but um, providing services to veterans, I think it was in the slides about making use of other resources. Um, it was maybe some stock language. I don't know, Michelle, if you can speak to that, the mention of um, when you have clients who are also veterans and, and making use of tapping into VA benefits. Yes, um, so it was twofold. So first of all, um, it's under other expectations in the NOFO. It says SAMHSA encourages all recipients to address the behavioral health needs of active duty military service members, returning veterans and military families in designing and developing their programs and to consider prioritizing this population for services when appropriate. And it also um, right above that says um, recipients should also consider other systems from which a potential service recipient may be eligible for services. For example, the Veterans Health Administration. So. Those were the two mentions for veterans. Great, thank you. And it looks like we have a question from Lon. Thank you so much. A um, couple of quickies. One is, uh, can an EUI make more than one application? Or is it uh, each EUI has the chance to make one application against that UI. That's one question. Um, and when you say UI, UI, the EUI, the uh, unique identifier. Okay. okay. Sorry. That's the only for the yes, application. Sorry, it's okay. So sometimes you can only have one that goes against that EUI. Sometimes they permit more than one if it's a variation of a program or a different program altogether for consideration. How will this be viewed? For this NOFO, um, and sorry, there, there's been a lot of really good questions in the chat, and I hope um, that people see the answers we put in there. But um, there's language in the NOFO you'll see um, that tribes and tribal organizations may only be included in one award application. Okay. And yeah. let me um, just let you know what page that is on page 20 of the NOFO. Thank you. And uh, final question is, uh, will you be accepting letters of support in the application? Um, there is a, some language in the attachment section um, that letters of support will, would not be allowed as a substitute for letters of commitment. But 
um, I, I, you could, you know, as long as you're not submitting them in place of letters, actually it says here, do not include letters of support. So I misspoke. <laughs> so yeah, do not include letters of support. And that's on page 24. Okay. So we, we would like to see letters of commitment. And there's a, a distinction. They, they kind of define what that means on page 24. And I'll put it in the chat here. Did, uh, was that your questions? Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Sure. And um, Jamie has a question. Hello again. So my question is related to the supplemental funding. Do we highlight county data in addition to our local data to really kind of paint the picture of the environment in which the services will be provided? Or is it going to be like where our services are gonna be provided and they fall into a certain county and the funding will be automatically applied? How does that work? Like what's the best way to kind of make sure that that's clear, you know, that if we're applicable to a specific county that that shows in our application? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a very good question. Um, we're not asking you to do any sort of um, epidemiological work or anything. Basically, um, we're just asking you to take a look at the Appendix B with the list of counties and indicate which of those counties you'll be providing any kind of services to with your grant funding. So, um, you know, we have done the work and we explain in a footnote on page 36, what went into this list. And we were under, just as like a side note, we were in, we were under a congressional mandate to update our formula to try and identify the states and tribes that are hardest hit by the opioids crisis. And that's what we've tried to do with this list. And so you would just let us know if you're serving any of the counties listed here, even if you're serving just a few clients from those counties. Um, you would put the name of those counties, you know, one or more counties that you're serving into the table that we're asking for in Appendix A. And that's all you would need to do. And then after we make the grant awards, we'll be able to determine the, the actual amount of the supplemental funding. Okay, thank you. I did see in the questions in the chat, somebody did say, what if you provide services to two counties? So we're primarily, you know, in one county, but we have members who live in the neighboring county. How does that work? Is the answer in the chat box? I'm sorry. Right. Um, yes, if, if you're, you know, if you're serving people from that other county, that counts as serving that county. So, um, you know, we're not limiting you to just saying identify one county, but list any of the counties that you will serve from that Appendix B. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you for that question, the answer. Okay, uh, and Latoya has a question. Yes, my question was around the letters of commitment. So our entire organization, we keep all of our services pretty much in-house. Are we required to get a letter of commitment from within the Choctaw Nation, or is that just for external partners? The letters of commitment are, are just for um, external partners. So you would not have to get letters of commitment, you know, uh, okay. internally if you're the applicant. All right, thank you for that. That was the question we were working on this morning, actually, so thank you. Can you give us an idea, a ballpark figure for the supplemental uh, funds? Like, it's awfully hard to do a budget without having, you know, a ballpark of what that supplemental might be by county. Right. You you won't. Uh, you should just do your budget based on the base award amount, and then, similar to how we've done it, but in the past, we'll be asking you for an updated budget after the award date. 
Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we I have I am not able to give you a ballpark figure. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So in um previous tours, <laughs> there was always a need for a resolution. So is that something that um is no longer a lot um required? Because I did not see it in the FOA, I didn't see it in the application guide. That's based off of the letter of commitment question people are um, inquiring about. So that's only for external, um, but maybe I misread it. So no more tribal resolutions and we don't need a letter of commitment from our tribes when we're a tribal organization. I don't think we um, explicitly required resolutions in the past. It's just that, you know, I know you, you work for a tribal organization. So if you work for a tribal organization, and you're working on behalf of some tribes, you you might have required a resolution or they might have required a resolution. Um, but everything that you see is is going to be listed on that attachments page. Um, and I'm just trying to find out what page that was, but there's the list of attachments that we're requiring. And so um, on pages 24 through 25 of the NOFO, that's where you'll see what's required. We are, we are not requiring resolutions. Okay, thank you for the for clarifying. You're welcome. And I had received some questions. How many recipients will receive funding and what is the award ceiling? So um, we anticipate funding up to 130 grants. And the award ceiling is based on those tables that you see in Appendix A and B. And I had a question on whether the grant is, if this is a competitive grant or not, and it is, the TOR is technically a competitive grant. And so, you know, we do have independent reviewers score the applications and we award based on the scoring. And there's a few more questions in the Q&A. Um, I think we answered Latoya's question. Um, can the full application be submitted on grants.gov or are there documents that must be submitted on ERA Commons also? Would any of our team like to take that? Everything should be able to be submitted through um, grants.gov. Um, when we're talking about making corrections after we um, have received the application, then it though it would probably be through ERA Commons. But ERA Commons is where you'll do some of your registration, um, but the application in its entirely should be submitted through grants.gov. And there is also a uh, document that is referenced in the NOFO um, that provides complete instructions on how to submit your grant. So I would refer to that as well. And we have a question in the Q&A. What happens if our, with our budget if contingency management allocation is approved to be higher than $75 per person? Um, and is that $75 per person per year? So yes, we are still at the $75 per person per year limit for contingency management. And if that uh, if that limit somehow gets increased, you um, you know you will be able to do a budget revision. Budget revisions are are allowable post award. And um, we have some questions in the chat. Heather had asked, if we serve individuals that reside in a county that is outside of our service area, do we list that county as well? And I think I answered that, that yes, if you if you see a lot of clients from another county, you know, that would count as serving that, that county with your, your grant funds. And the SAMHSA website has a list of harm reduction supplies um, 
this is another question. Uh, vitamin C is mentioned. We were discussing internally, wondering why vitamin C specifically is mentioned. I do not know offhand why that is. Uh, someone wants to respond? Yeah, I can take that. So vitamin C is frequently mixed with certain drugs, particularly opioids, as it helps it dissolve in water. And so sometimes if people are injecting things um, without like vitamin C, it will use other forms of it, such as like orange juice or acid um, to mix the drugs and that can cause infection. And so if you're using sterile vitamin C, it helps everything disperse through and it creates a safer ejection environment. Thank you for that information, that's helpful. Um, and I had referenced this guide that I'm gonna put it in the chat and I think it's linked to on our slides as well. This is this was developed in January this year and it's um, this is more of the instruction guide on how to submit grant applications. And I know in our slides, we also reference a guide on how to develop a competitive grant application. So uh, definitely make sure to check that out as well. So at this point, I'm not seeing any questions, but I'll, I'll give it a, a minute in case people have more questions. I know we had a lot come through. I'm oh, sorry, wow. I missed it. The, uh, how many years is this for? This is a five-year grant. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. And if you have questions that come up, um, you'll see on the NOFO, you know, for programmatic questions, you can send emails to me. And then we have an email account if you have more um, budgetary or administrative questions. So, you know, you can continue to submit questions until the, hopefully you're not sending in questions the day before the due date, but you can <laughs> technically submit questions until the grant is due. And then we will post the recording of this webinar and the slides on our webpage where you found the NOFO. Uh, Valencia has a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have to choose at least one activity under each of the treatment, recovery, harm reduction, and prevention, correct? Um, yeah, so this is, I, I know that uh, the language is confusing. Um, so as long as you're doing at least one activity under one of those categories, you know, that would be sufficient. You don't have to do something under treatment and recovery and prevention and harm reduction. And I think you posted an example that you were going to do something under treatment and something under recovery. That would be fine. You know, we have projects that are only doing a few things under prevention. That's fine. Um, but you just have to be doing at least one of the activities in that required activity section, whether it's something under treatment, something under pre prevention, something under recovery or harm reduction. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. What category would surveillance uh, fit under? I think that um, that we have a, an allowable activity for data collection and evaluation. Um, so I don't know that that, you know, that would be allowable, but I don't know that that would meet the requirement for the required activities. You you know you could send us an email with more information, and we could talk further. Thank you. You're welcome. And then we had one question: ERA Commons registration on NIH website. Are you asking how to get registered with ERA Commons? That is Alvin. Yes. 
Um, I would follow the, I know it can be a complicated process, so I would follow the that link, the application guide, because um, that will contain all the steps to get set up. I think, you know, your organization, if you're a tribe or a tribal organization, you all need, you need to get your organization set up on ERA and then um, whoever is going to be the project director and, and signing official needs to be on there. So you'll want to make sure you've taken all those steps prior to applying. All right, I'll, I'll just give one last opportunity for questions. I just, sorry, Margo again. <laughs> I just came across um, just looking at attachment nine and tried to find one of the categories that you're asking for a service unit. Um, what uh, are you looking for there? It, it was name of tribe, the population estimate, service unit. And maybe I missed it. Right. It so that on page 35. Yeah, and that refers to, um, you know, when we're talking about the IHS user population data set, IHS, um, you know, they organize things according to the service unit. And so if you need that information, um, if you, you uh, we'll be sending out the, um, the IHS user population data set along with the slides. Okay, cool. But sometimes, sometimes you know, tribes are multiple tribes are included together in one IHS service unit. So, um, you know, it might not be immediately clear which service unit you are, but we're asking you to, to list there when, when you know what your service unit is. Okay. Thank but you. If, you. if anybody has any more questions about the, you know, the IHS user population part or the appendix A or B, you can email them to us. Thanks. Okay. And okay, we have another question about the GIPRA. Can you go over again what makes up the GIPRA SPARS target? I think we could briefly do that. Would it be possible to share the slides one last time? Yes, just one second. It's slide 28. They skip back through the slides. There should be a, a section B outcomes table. They arrive at a slide titled section B outcomes table. There it is. Okay. So what we're asking for, first of all, first and foremost, is just for you to list all of the uh, the number of clients you expect to provide each type of service to. So if you're doing counseling, you know, how many people will you provide that service, that treatment service to each year of the grant? And this is, we're only talking about grant funded services. So that that's pretty straightforward. Just how many people will you reach with each type of service? But when we talk about the GIPRA target, this specifically refers to that GIPRA client level interview. And if you're familiar with that, you're only doing that interview for mostly treatment clients and potentially some clients who are receiving some recovery support services, such as peer recovery support services. So you're basically going to take your treatment, your number of treatment clients and any harm reduction, I'm sorry, any recovery services where you'll do the GIPRA and add those two numbers together. So if you're only doing like MOUD or counseling, you'll take that number of treatment clients and that will be your GIPRA target. But if you're doing, you know, MOUD and peer recovery support services where you'd also be completing the GIPRA, you'll take the number from treatment and recovery support, add them together, and that will be your GIPRA target. And this is something that can be, you know, figured out post-award. This is not going to affect your, uh, like the, the score or your grant application or anything like that. So um, 
So, you know, just do your best to put your correct numbers in and, and you know, that's something we can iron out later on if we have to. Okay. And I think we are at the end of our allotted time. So I want to thank everyone and, and really appreciate all the questions and hope everyone has a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.